there's almost this you know, this invisible quality that you have to have. How do you transition to that world for yourself? Well, I, I practice uh, becoming invisible, you know, and, and um, uh, moving quietly, uh, moving around the subject, not, not letting off too much energy, but keeping my camera in view so that they can see what I'm gonna do. There's oftentimes that tension that makes a good picture, which is that the camera is clearly there, but that it somehow isn't, isn't distorting things too wildly. My interest in war, my identity as an American, and my interest in journalism and photography is all kind of crystallizing into like one very clear, clear path for me. The more I've learned about photography, the more I've almost been able to slow down time. I've had the rare opportunity to meet many amazing photographers who move through the different landscapes to create powerful images. I'm always inspired by how these images transform the way we see people and understand the world. A great photograph needs no explanation, but on capture, these incredible people tell the story of creating their most memorable images. I'm Mark Seliger, and this is Capture. Hi, I'm Mark Seliger, and welcome to Capture. Today I'm joined by Golden Globe nominated actor Aaron Eckhart whose hit films include The Rum Diary, Thank You for Smoking, and The Dark Knight. He's also a self-proclaimed photo geek who sees a connection between photography and acting through the use of creativity and imagination to tell the story. And Peter Van Ochtemal, a photographer whose documentation of the consequences of an American war in Iraq and Afghanistan have brought him critical acclaim and awards. He was a recipient of the 2012 W. Eugene Smith Award. Thank you both for coming today. It's, it's great to be sitting here with, in the presence of such talent. How did you start in photography? Because it's, it's not only, it seems like it's a passion, but it's kind of, now it's an extension of who you are. Yeah, it's really consumed my life. Um, I was on a, a photo shoot with Herb Ritz one time, and Herb and I started talking about photography. Um, and then I went to uh, the David Fahey Gallery, and I started looking at prints, and um, I couldn't believe how much the prints cost. Herb had, had a show there and uh, they were beautiful black and white prints. And I decided, well, I'm not gonna buy that picture. I'm gonna go out and buy a camera. I'm gonna buy a lens and some film, and I'm gonna get a teacher, and I'm going to make that picture. You never studied photography in college? It wasn't like something no, that- No, I was really consumed with acting. I was a surfer, oh. a big surfer. I lived oh. in Hawaii, Australia, and uh, that consumed my life. And when I got into acting full time, you know, it really, as you guys know, I mean, whatever your passion is, yeah. you only have room for that, so. Uh, Do you think there's a connection in surfing and photography and acting? Do you think that there's like a, a kind of mindset? Staying that, in the moment yeah. and being totally aware at all times yeah. and um, not judging and, um, and knowing when to click the shutter or to say the right thing or not say the right thing or take the right wave. Yeah. It's all about using your instincts. Yeah. Speaking of instincts, Peter, uh, you, you, t you seem to have enormous amount of instinct in terms of the work that you do. And how did you get started? Because uh, I know that you studied at Yale. Mm -hmm. I studied history, actually. Oh, OK. I, I'm self-taught in photography. For whatever reason, kind of almost from like the dawn of my conscious thought, I had an interest in war. Maybe it's something to do with growing up in the suburbs with a loving family and everything being perfect and wondering why so much of the rest of the world is in chaos. And in college, I started getting interested in journalism and I read a few books about Vietnam, um, turned me on, led me to, led, started leading me to photographers and then suddenly I realized what, what, a, what a camera was capable of. Nine eleven happened when I was a sophomore and then the invasion of Iraq when I was a senior. And suddenly I sort of realized, you know, very quickly, okay, you know, my interest in war, my identity as an American, and my interest in journalism and photography is all kind of crystallizing into like one very clear, clear path for me. And so at that point I realized, okay, how, this is what I need to do. How do you do. determine that you're going to be a war photographer and, and then how do you start? It didn't necessarily come entirely natural to me because you know, I grew up in the suburbs and I went to Yale. I led a very uh, isolate, uh, existence isolated from reality. You know, I was pretty naive, so I didn't want to jump right into a war zone. And so I went to, I lived in China for a year on a fellowship um, out of college. And then I, uh, and then I moved to South Africa for a year. 
And that was, and w there I started kind of testing my limits a little bit, pushing into er different areas that were well outside my comfort zone. First, there was this sort of excitement, doing what I thought I needed to be doing with my life, followed by a certain amount of horror as I started seeing, you know, people die around me and was threatened with death on many occasions myself. Which is and this, then, which is, this is, image which that is we're looking this. at right yeah. here. It looks like a terrifying experience there and pretty close to something. It was in some ways. At that point, you know, I'd already been covering war for about three years when I finally was able to take an IED picture that worked. I'd been hit by a bunch of IEDs already at that point. Pictures just never worked out. Usually I was in a vehicle. Um, but that one, I finally did. And at that point, it's like I was so, you know, things, as you, things slow down when you become a photographer. And I feel like the more I've learned about photography, the more I've almost been able to slow down time. It happened just about when I thought it was gonna happen, actually, so I was ready. I was just gonna like, they're either gonna start shooting or something's gonna blow up. Something blew up, and, so and I shot injured? it and took a knee at the same time. No, thank God, they blew it up too soon. I started running forward with these other guys. I was shooting on the fly and expecting to forward. see these mangled. Yeah, okay. running forward I towards the blast. The other guy. <laughs> Not running backwards. You what can't do that attitude? with the Marines, you know? They'll, they'll, they'll never let you on another patrol if you don't do what they do. But when you're, but after a few months of fighting every day, you know, fighting becomes normal too. It's always amazing to me, like, how quickly we as humans can adjust to a new normal, like, even if it seems insane from the outside world. Whenever I do anything with a charitable organization, I always say, I'll do it if you let me shoot. Um, I was seeing the sense of complex compositions, a surreal quality to the work. My favorite moment is when they're all sitting on the railing of the, uh, of the bridge. When I look at the picture, I, I, I imagine, I dream about their futures. Where are they now? What are they doing? We just walked around, went to some bars, some restaurants, and just found people who we thought had this kind of, you know, sort of distinct beauty to them.